Man, I was trying to get up here before they told you to sit down. Thank you. We, we're going to continue in our study, our series, going through the book of Philippians. Reasons to rejoice. Reasons to rejoice. Coming from the first chapter, verses 27 through 30, we ask those who are able and capable, able and capable, <laughs> We stand and honor the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Philippians, the first chapter, beginning at verse 27. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. Amen? Amen. Amen. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we've come before your throne of grace, just thanking you for this great opportunity that you've given us. We pray now in the precious name of Jesus Christ that thy word would go forward with power and conviction. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 We're going to talk for a few minutes about conducting yourself worthy of the gospel. Have you ever had the opportunity to go out and share the word of God, to go out and to witness about Jesus Christ into a community that sometimes can be not receptive to the gospel. In fact, there are times when, there's times when we can actually be people who are belligerent, who are abusive, who are disrespectful over the fact that the body of Christ is out there sending the word of God forth. It doesn't take too long for a faithful witnessing Christian to realize there is a tremendous spiritual conflict that exists in the world over the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and, and through this, through this opposition, through this opposition, through this opposing of the gospel, through this belligerent and abusive treatment that we can receive in trying to witness for the word of God sometimes, Sometimes we just go into a shell, like a turtle who's safe. It just goes back to a safe place. I'm safe if I just stay in my shell and, 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 and don't have to get out. I feel comfortable here. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, through these first 26 verses, has been talking about how we should rejoice in Christ Jesus. He talked about his suffering. He talked about the fact that he was in prison, chained to a guard, and, and how he was suffering, but through all of that, he was rejoicing. Those first 26 verses of this first chapter was Paul talking about his suffering. He was talking about how he was rejoicing and why he was rejoicing in his situation. But here in this 27th verse, there is a transition that takes place where now the Apostle Paul reaches out to the church at Philippi, who he had such affection for, such emotion for, and he was reminding them and encouraging them with this word of God. And he realized in this text that there are many, many verses that include military terms, athletic terms, that there is a battle to be fought. And as he was chained to this Roman soldier, he uses some of these metaphors. He talks about standing firm. He talks about striving. He talks about an opponent, and he talks about suffering to tell us that there is a spiritual war that's going on and a price must be paid for the Christian to be faithful soldiers of Jesus Christ. Paul is encouraging the church at Philippi to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. And one of the points that just jumped out in the text is our conduct has an impact. Our conduct has an impact. When I first saw this word conduct, I was thinking about when I was in school, I got a grade for conduct, <laughs> citizenship. And that's what this really means in the Greek. It talks about to be a good citizen for the body you represent, 
a good citizen. These Philippians, you will remember from the introduction, Philippi was a Roman colony, and the people there were citizens of Rome. As citizens of Rome, they had standards of rules to live by. They also had certain privileges about being a Roman citizen. Obviously, Paul is talking about the fact that our citizenship goes beyond our country. Yes, and I'm very proud to say that I'm an American, and I'm sure my brother Robin is very proud and his wife of being from Norway. But Paul is saying this citizenship that we're talking about goes beyond country, it goes beyond where we live, it goes beyond being a proud Texan, but it talks about we have a different citizenship. Yes, my brothers and sisters, our citizenship is in heaven. You see, Philippians, the third chapter in verse 20, it says, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and in our study in September, we'll get to this passage, and I'll go in more depth at that time, but the point is for today, we need to recognize that our Christian, if we are citizens of heaven. And our first responsibility is to the citizenship of to live our lives for Jesus Christ. And as part of that, we ought to be good citizens while we are here. This world is to see that the Christian should be different in actions and attitudes. A Christian should regardless of political views, regardless of who's in office, we should always be striving to respect the authority that's been placed over us and that we would continue to move forward with the spreading of the gospel. Our citizenship is in heaven. And as a result of that, our citizenship in heaven, our conduct should be restricted. Colossians 1, 9 and 10 says, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Did you notice in our text that the it opened up with the word only. It opened up with only. Paul is saying as Christians, if you do anything else, do this. If there's nothing else that you'll do, do this. If you want to have an impact on the world, do this. Paul is bringing that focus to the body to say, if there's only one thing we're going to do, do this. Conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel to impact the building of the kingdom. Above all cost, do this. It was a priority. It was crucial to be an effective Christian. Paul encourages the Philippians to be willing to suffer for the gospel cause. He exhorts them to have a manner of life that is becoming to one who believes in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one of the military terms is, and that he gives us to help us in this Christian battle, to help us, he says, we must stand firm as one body. Christians are to work together in one spirit, one mind, for the sake of the gospel. The point is clear here. Christians are to be united around the gospel of Christ. All Christians, our drive and our ambition should be to live for Christ. There must be Christian unity if the gospel is to make an impact on the unsaved world. There must be one spine, one mind, one spirit moving in the same direction so that the gospel can go forward. If Christians are warring within, if there is division within the body of Christ, it limits our ability to take our fight to the enemy. Satan knows the secret to defeat the gospel, to divide, to conquer, and to silence a Christian. Satan loves to see divisions in the body of Christ. Christians are to stand firm 
in one spirit in the word of God. To stand firm is a military term. It means to hold firm, to hold your ground. Christians should understand that there are times when we have to just go on the defense. Stand firm is a military term telling us that it's time for us to hold fast in the midst of opposition, and there will be opposition. But unlike the turtle, we must stand firm. We must continue to fight the good fight. When Christians receive opposition from the world because of sharing the Gospels, we are then more than ever out of being encouraged to go on and fight a good fight. Because can I tell you something, my brothers and sisters? You will know when you are doing the work of the Lord. You're going to know it. You know why? You're going to be opposed. You see, as long as we blend in with society and, and say and do the things that society say are the norms, you'll be accepted. But when you stand up and preach the word of God and spread the word of God, I'm telling you right now, you're going to get opposed. Paul is reminding us that during this time of opposition, we should be able to take glory in the fact that I am going through this for the sake of the gospel. All of us should be willing to go through some suffering for Christ's sake. And then he tells us, don't be alarmed. Don't be, don't be surprised when you come into opposition. There are many opponents and enemies to the gospel. And it startled the Philippian churches that there was so much opposition. They were alarmed. That word alarmed, <laughs> when the Greek word said it was like a horse that's being startled and caught off guard. In those days, the opponents of the gospel were many. There were legalistic Jews who opposed the word of God. Then we find that there were worldly Gentiles who despised the moral code that the gospel dictated that they would live. The Greek and Roman intellectuals thought the gospel rationale unacceptable, that if it couldn't be proven, there was a problem. And today we have some of the same situations where intellectuals want to be able to have proof for everything that exists. And even today we have legalists who teach that we must work for salvation, that it's about our deeds that will get us into heaven. There is opposition today against the moral, the moral advocates that we hold as Christians. When we stand on the word of God and say, this is what God says, how we should live our lives, there are people who are against that because they choose to live their lives the way they want to live it. Oh, my brothers and sisters, New Agers hate the narrowness of Christianity, which claims that Christ is the only way. Yes, there are people who say that we're not flexible enough, that we're not understanding enough. But my brothers and sisters, we need to be prepared to deal with those kind of things. And Paul himself got to the point where he was shaken by the opposition that came against him. You can remember when he was in Acts 18, he was at the church of Corinth, and he was preaching to the Jews of that day about the gospel of Jesus Christ. He got so discouraged about the opposition that came his way. He said, you know what? I'm going to stop talking to you Jews, and I'm going to the Gentiles. And then in his night, the Lord came to him in a dream. In Acts 18, 9 and 10, it says, One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. In the midst of his lowest ebb, in the midst of the greatest opposition, God came to him and strengthened him. Can I tell you, my brothers and sisters, you get on the battlefield for the Lord. Yes, you're going to have some opposition, but in your weakest day, in your weakest hour, when you think the whole world is against you, God will let you know that he's with you. Amen. And in fact, we get that encouragement. Ephesians 6 and 11 says, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And then he goes on to say, strive forward with faith. You know, when Paul talked about putting on the full armor of God, oh yeah, he said, put on the helmet of salvation. Oh yeah, have your shield of faith. But you know what offensive weapon he had? All those things were defensive. 
The offensive he, weapon that he had was the sword, which is the word of God. Yes, my brothers and sisters, there are times when we are on the defensive. Yes, when we have to use our shields and we have to hold our ground. But then Paul is reminding us that we as Christians ought to go on the attack, that we ought to go forward with what weapon? The word of God. And part of that, as I shared with you earlier, suffering is coming. But 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. My brothers and sisters, suffering goes along with Christianity. We need to be prepared for that and understand that. And just like that turtle that goes into a shell, the turtle is safe with his head tucked in the shell, his arms and legs tucked into the shell. He's safe. You know what the problem is? While he's safe, he can't move forward. As Christians, we need to understand we can't go into our shells. We have to expose ourselves and move forward with the gospel of Jesus Christ, even when it's going to cost us something. And that's what Paul was encouraging the church to do. If there's only one thing, if there's only one purpose that we as Christians should do, is to hold up the blood-stained banner of Jesus Christ and tell the whole world there is salvation in Jesus Christ and him alone. And Paul was reminding the church, don't ever lose sight of that. Don't ever forget that. Don't get so wrapped up in so many other things. He says, only this thing, this purpose, should be what drives the body of Christ. And my brothers and sisters, let me tell you why it's so important. In the word, it was very clear. There's salvation granted to us who believe. Granted means a gift that's been given to us. But then he also says the wrath of God, the destruction for those who oppose him and don't know him. So my brothers and sisters, because we know there will be people who will be sent to an eternity in hell, we ought to be willing to suffer to get that gospel news to those people. And I pray in the precious and powerful name of Jesus Christ, that each one of us would take up that banner and be willing to continue to go forth. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we are so grateful and thankful for this word. <clears throat> Thank you for the power the, for us and able to go forth and spread the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. Our heads are bowed, and we just thank you and just ask that you would continue to strengthen us, continue to watch over us and keep us, that we would be worthy gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.